to our August meeting of the executive. Um, before we start, just want to pass on the sad news of the passing of former Somerset County Council and South Somerset District Council, Derek Yeomans, at the weekend. We will pay proper tribute at the next full council, but just want to send our, our sympathy to his friends and families. I know he will be greatly missed by his community. Um, also, just to send our good wishes to Councillor Andy Kendall, who's in South Mid Hospital at the moment, uh, as we spoke poorly. Um, I'm sure we wish him, all wish him the best for a speedy recovery. OK, um, it is uh, my duty to remind you that it's only executive lead members present in the room that are taking the decisions at this meeting. Others in attendance are there to provide advice to the executive. Um, just to note that Councillor Sarah Dyke has stepped down from her role as lead member for the environment and climate change. Those responsibilities are currently being covered by associate lead member Dixie Darch, um, but we have not, not yet made the formal replacement on that role. Uh, the agenda and papers for this meeting have been published on the Council's website in advance of the meeting, and there will be an audio recording of this meeting which will be published on the Council's website in due course. We'll be using a hybrid format. The executive lead members and key officers are physically present here at County Hall. Other key, office, key officers present include um, executive directors um, for various portfolios and the monitoring officer. Um, other elected members and officers may physically or remotely join the meeting um, to speak on specific agenda items or just to observe. And this meeting is being broadcast and therefore other members of the public and partners can observe us remotely. Um, in terms of the online um, participants, please can you only use the chat function for the purposes of this meeting and primarily to indicate that you wish to speak. Though in preference, I would prefer to use the hands up function if you are able to and please only speak at my invitation and say your name before speaking so that people are aware of who is talking and can we all make sure that our microphones and cameras are off when we are not speaking. OK, so moving on to agenda item one, uh, we have apologies for absence. I have two apologies, Councillor Federica Smith Roberts and Councillor Mike Rigby. Any other apologies for absence from members? Not seeing any. We also have apologies from Chief Executive Duncan Sharkey, uh, who and Alan Jones is sat in the chair next to me to deputise. Thank you, Alan. Uh, do we have any declarations of interest on item two, please? not seeing anything other than those already published on the website, of course. Uh, we have minutes to approve from the 10th of July 2023. Uh, any comments, questions or queries on those minutes are welcome. Looking around the room, nobody's indicating to speak. May I have a proposal then, please? Proposed cancellation, seconded Councillor Ruddle. All those executive lead members in favour, please. All those against, that's clearly carried. Uh, we have public question time. I'm advised that there are no public questions. Is that still the case? That is still the case. So we swiftly got on to um, item five, which is the academization finance policy and procedure. And I'd like to invite Councillor Tessa Munt to introduce this item. Good morning, Tessa. Good morning, Bill. Thank you very much indeed. I suppose, sorry, I should say chair. Forgive me. Um, delighted to introduce the Academisation Finance and Policy and Procedure paper. Um, this has, and I'm sorry that um, Amelia Walker, who's done so much work on this as the Service Director for Education Partnerships for Schools, is unable to be here today. Um, but I have absolutely no doubt that Claire will, Claire Winter, as Director of Children's Services, will cover those points which I do not cover in my introduction. Um, what I would like to say is that we have been absolutely clear that we wish to be fair and open and transparent in the way that we work and that we know, don't we, that in the Education for Life strategy, we've looked to make sure that we increase the level of clarity and consistency of support for schools so that they can feel better 
um, and deliver much better outcomes for children and young people. We also face a financial situation which requires some rigour and um, we have shared this paper um, with the Somerset Education Leadership Group, which includes the Department for Education and it also includes the Diocese Bath and Wells, who are very important to delivering education in this county. Um, so in line also with advice from the Department for Educational Regions Director, we have addressed some of those, um, the financial contribution that um, is required to make sure that academisation happens smoothly and effectively. Um, just so that everybody is utterly clear, we had at the beginning of this year 133 schools um, that were run by the local authority. Um, we are aware that, as everybody is, I'm sure, that um, when there is a poor Ofsted re result, be that two requires improvement results in a row or an inadequate rating by Ofsted, then the, there can be a direct um, uh, uh, academy order which requires a school to academise, um, or the schools can choose to convert by choice, um, They um, and that will be done through a vote of the governing board. The information that we have provided is having scarred, as we regularly do, the um, minutes of governors' meetings. We are aware of those schools that require, they, they wish to convert by choice. I think there are 11 of those at the moment. Um, and we have built into that a pipeline of how we may deal with academisation indeed to make sure that we do have rigorous but open and transparent and a settled set of a state that people so that everybody in schools, parents, young people can understand what is happening so they have the certainty that um, we have promised them. I'm going to hand over now to Claire Winter to actually go through the detail of the paper, if I may. Thank you. Thank you, Tessa. So uh, this paper, as Tessa said, is, uh, looks at the academisation finance policy um, procedure um, in relation to Somerset schools. So what we're asking, as it's set out in point three, in terms of the recommendations, if I just take you through the, the, a bit more of the detail about each of those recommendations, um, and then obviously happy to take any questions. So under point three, we're asking the executive to agree an amendment to what is called the core offer contract, which is in paragraphs nine to 12 of this paper. So the core offer um, is a traded package that the local authority provides to local authority schools. Um, academies can choose to buy into that too if they wish to. And that um, currently is an annual um, agreement and it ensures that all schools have the support, that maintained schools have the support that they need to improve their offer to the children that they're educating. What we're proposing is that um, currently all schools in the pipeline for this year for academisation are charged for the core offer in full and are not um, eligible for a rebate in this financial year. And for the following year and years beyond that, they will be eligible for a rebate based on the month that they convert, um, as long as we are notified by the 30th of November in the in the year preceding the conversion, um, they will then in the following year only have to pay for a, a month on month the, the costs of the core offer until conversion time, um, until they actually convert to an academy. The reason we're doing that, that we want to do that, is because um, we the core offer obviously involves traded services, it involves the employment of staff in the council and is, um, staff employed by partners, and to provide a rebate in a shorter order than we have described now is not possible in terms of maintaining the offer for the schools that remain maintained for the school for the local authority during that year, because we'd have to cut services significantly during that year and that would mean that offer is not viable. If we have the notice period of the 30th of November, we have four months before the next financial year starts to refine that offer, to reduce it um, in terms of volume and to um, make sure that we have the right partners and the right staff in place, possibly reducing that if we need to in a managed way. Um, so that I think explains the, the core offer proposal. The second um, recommendation is to approve the council's academy charge for schools electing to convert to academy status, which is paragraphs 13 to 15 of the report. So, um, as um, Councillor Munt said, at the moment, uh, the, well, the legislation says that when a school converts through directive academy order, 
the local authority cannot charge for the academisation process. But when a school decides to convert voluntarily, when it's their choice, we can charge for the academisation process. And every school is awarded by government a £25,000 grant to help meet the costs of academisation. We've looked at a full cost recovery calculation for what we would need to charge schools to be able to do that for the voluntary converters. And the charge for that this year would be £10,575. That is more than we have previously been charging. But on the basis of the financial situation, we feel we should be looking at full cost recovery. And that is in line with other local authority areas. And we've had extensive discussions with the regions office. Um, and they agree that is in line with other local authority areas. Um, and that that's a viable um, uh, amount to, to charge. We would, of course, review that annually and adjust that in line with inflation at the time of the um, at the time the academisation charge was made. Uh, the third recommendation is to approve the uh, proposal to apply the Department of Education guidance when dealing with surplus and deficit balances on conversion. Again, that's in paragraph 16 to 20 of this paper. Um, so. In terms of the legislation, um, currently it says that in cases of a directive academy order, the deficit is retained by the local authority and the surplus is retained by the local authority. And for voluntary conversions, the deficit and the surplus are transferred to the trust when a school chooses, chooses to convert. So we only really need to deal with the first issue in terms of directive academy orders in terms of deficits and surplus. The current policy is um, that uh, the which was made in 2019 is that schools currently retain the first £20,000 of any surplus and then any sum between £20,000 and £100,000 is split 50-50 between the um, school or the trust as it goes into it and the local authority and any sum over £100,000 is retained fully by the council. Um, what we in, it would like to do is revert to the statutory guidance Again, we were more generous in that policy than the statutory guidance allowed, um, which says that um, we would retain all the um, surplus in, a, in that situation, um, accepting under paragraph 21 any other aspects that we would need to take into account. So we would not retain capital balances, third party monies, um, parental contributions or unspent DfE grants in specific circumstances and several other points that are in that paragraph. Um, in um, point 21. We have um, spoken to schools about this paper. We do not have to consult with schools because it is local authority policy. But as Councillor Munt said, in the interest of transparency and wanting to work alongside our schools, we have consulted with them. And they did ask that this point 21 was put into this paper to make it absolutely clear um, what was exempted from that surplus requirement, which is why that's been added in, in some detail. Um, and the final recommendation of this paper is that we implement the proposal in relation to surplus and deficit balances, as I've just discussed, from the date of to, from today's date from this meeting, um, so that we're clear that from the beginning of the new term it's in place and any academisation from the beginning of the new term would fall under the new policy. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Claire, and thank you, Tessa. Uh, first of all, open up to uh, executive and associate league members comment or questions? Well, that's a sign of an outstanding presentation. <laughs> um, and moving to um, just check with Chair of Scrutiny, uh, Lee, I, th well, it was, I think you're hidden there in the corner. Um, um, has this come before your committee and all happy and si with the sign off? Thank you very much. And so go around the room, uh, Councillor Francis Nicholson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, clarity for schools is essential, um, as is a constant striving to the best use of money to improvement in all schools. And in that sense, um, I, that's where I start from. Um, I do have some questions that I want to ask. Um, one lot about the charges and one set about the, um, the balances. Uh, in charges, we're talking about full cost recovery. Um, but it'll be much more expensive to do the legal work for in some circumstances and much less expensive to do it in other circumstances. 
Um, are there any circumstances when it will cost this authority less than the charge we're going to make? If there are those circumstances, this feels pretty hard on a school. Um, and of course, it, it may be that with a, 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 are we actually trying to, to make it full cost recovery as a whole um, over all the schools that we academize, in which case it does, it, it is likely to mean that, that some schools win and some schools lose. And, and I just would like some thought on how we'll support or whether we will support the schools where actually um, it's going to cost us a lot less than we're charging. So that's um, one thing. Um, the other things are around the the balances and the 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 the, um, the, 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 the surpluses being recovered uh, uh, being retained by the local authority. What is the um, What's the situation finding academy sponsors for, for schools that are failing, which is the ones we're talking about? Um, how difficult is it to find um, academy sponsors at the moment? What is the what is the impact at the moment of our of of um, uh, uh, of our treatment of balances on the willingness of good sponsors to come forward and the decisions that the regional director is making? And what will be the impact? on that of the change and um i think one might want to monitor that a bit in the future so that's that's the next bit um and i actually why are schools that are failing sitting on surpluses so the bit, bit of actually understanding what these surpluses might be um and therefore whether actually mm, that's the, uh, 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 whether in fact they really are sitting on any surpluses because because if in fact they're really not sitting on much of the way of surplus then we needn't worry about it too much uh but if they are that worries me in terms of our interaction with maintained schools to say look you shouldn't be sitting on balances you should be spending the money on children who are there now um what are we going to do are we going to get anything in the local authority or are we merely diminishing the loss in absorbing deficits um if we do actually end up with some actual cash what are we going to do with it in terms of education and schools um and then the last set of questions i, I hope this is all writable um the last set of questions is a uh, paragraph 21 um produces A to H of exceptions, money that is disregarded in working out what the surplus um, is. Uh, and that perhaps comes back to what on earth is this school sit sitting on a large surplus for at all? What is it that is not covered by these exceptions? Um, and why might it be there? And then of the, the exceptions sound in, 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 uh, absolutely sensible in terms of the third party monies, the uh, DFE grants, parental contributions, all those things. Um, under H, we've got um, other agreed balances to cover future specific costs if these will be paid by the Academy. Does that mean that, or, e.g. funds that have been accumulated over a period for a project such as replacement of facilities and equipment, um, does it also cover things like um uh, uh, would it also be, cover something like the support an academy already knows it's going to need to put in would that be removed from the surplus that we we want to claw back i think that's enough thank you very much i'll, I'll try and answer the questions if i miss any or misinterpret them help um you need to help me out okay so the first question i think was about full cost recovery and would we charge any school more than we required in terms of the um, yeah. academisation costs? So um, the, the, the calculation has been made on the average cost of um, academisation. Sorry, do you want me to start again? No, no sorry. Cost. Those are the tone. OK. Um, so, yes, it's been made on the, the basis of average costs of academisation. Um, I think most schools do come into that average cost bracket, but we could certainly um, make sure that if any school came under that, that we weren't charging for that full amount. Um, that's not a, that's not an issue. We can certainly look at that. Um, we would not be charging more than was needed. 
the legal costs element of it, particularly the legal costs, usually the majority of the legal costs fall to the Academy Trust, um, which is in this paper. Um, so the um, lower legal costs would not uh, affect that figure. It's, it's internal costs, basically. Um, in terms of balances um, and surpluses, so you asked a question about the retained surpluses and the how easy it is to find academy sponsors for directors of academy order schools. Um, I'm not really able to answer that question because it's the Department of Education that finds the academy sponsors. So um, in terms of they would need to give a view, I think, about whether they felt it was easy or difficult at the moment to, to find those sponsors for schools converting to, academy, to academies. Um, the impact of the decision on whether schools are willing to academise in terms of the surplus yeah, decision, whether, whether, was, whether sponsors are willing to come forward. As I said, we did have two sessions. Um, well, we had two sessions online with schools which um, Matt's were invited to to um, have that discussion and the only comments are in the appendix in appendix three there were no there were a couple of small primary schools that asked questions about the um, exemptions which is why it's in this paper so that was clear but no map came forward and said that they were concerned about the um, change of policy around surpluses um, why do surpluses why do failing schools have surpluses I think that's um, a good question I'd say the majority don't of, of any significance uh, where they do that's usually a sign of the governing body um, failing in its role and certainly where we have had school surpluses not because that's a factor in its own but it's part of a range of factors we have put into an into executive boards to manage the finances of schools more appropriately that. yeah that's fine um, what do we do with the money that we would have um, from the surplus and also, I think you said, from the academisation costs? So no, the, 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 surpluses. the surplus money. OK, um, so in terms of the surplus money, we would be reinvesting that into the support for the maintained schools to make sure that maintained schools have a good school improvement offer and that we can improve that school improvement offer um, for the schools that require it. And obviously academies can buy into that offer if they choose to do so, so that they could um, be part of the school improvement offer offered by the local authority. Um, then you asked some questions about, oh, paragraph 21 in terms of the exemptions and what isn't included in the exemptions. Um, I can't give you a specific answer, I'm afraid, but whatever is left, I suppose, is the obvious answer um, that isn't involved in that would be um, part of the, the surplus that would be moved across. There are not a lot of schools that have a lot of surplus at the moment, and some schools are moving into deficit because of the financial situation. Um, so I don't think it's a particular issue as it stands. Um, and, you know, we can look at that when we look at individual schools in terms of what their surplus, what the surplus is in terms of when it's left, if you want to know that in any more detail as we move forward, that's not a problem. Um, was that any? Um, no, I think um, when schools are under direct of academy order and they move to the to a trust, that that trust takes it on the basis that they know that they will need to provide to support to that school, both financially um, and in resource. And um, there is a current Department of Education policy that if a multi-academy trust takes five schools, of which one is a director of academy order, they get um, a grant, an additional grant of three quarters of a million pounds to support them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, looking around the room for any further questions or online, I'm not seeing anything. Any further comment that we wish to raise? So, in in just in summary, um, you know, this this offers us the a policy which gives us a more transparent and financially rigorous methodology, um, and looks at um, I think adding some clarity and some visibility to to the canonisation process. Just to stress, it does follow statutory guidance, and it helps us to protect and manage the viability of our core offer which is obviously extremely important to the outcomes for our children. OK, I see a proposer from Councillor Munt and a seconder 
from Councillor Lyshon. Those in favour of the recommendations, please. And those against the recommendations, that's clearly carried. Okay. Move on to item six on the agenda, um, which is the update on the out out turn of position for across all legacy Somerset authorities for 22-23. Uh, Councillor Lyshon uh, to introduce, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I was hopeful that today we would have the outturn figures for all five councils in order to enable verbal updating today on the closing position of all those five predecessor councils. However, while we met the target date, which is shown on the table in item 17 of this paper, that's pages across pages 46 and 47, uh, we met that date for publication of Sedgemoor District Council Statement of Accounts. However, we did not meet the target date for publication of South Somerset District Council Statement of Accounts. So we continue to work with the figures we have <clears throat> on the understanding that more work remains to be completed and that external auditors, of course, can still raise further queries. So Jason Vaughan, our Section 151 officer, will give us uh, the figures that he is working with presently, and he will also give us more information on that table in item 17 that I have already mentioned. Uh, we also know that there is a particularly... Oh, I've turned upside down. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Well, I have to say, with the financial situation across the whole country and including external audit, I'm not in the least bit surprised if I've turned upside down. Thank you, Mandy, for letting me know. Um, so that uh, that challenging situation with external audit, we are seeing across the whole country. Some councils have outstanding audit opinion from as far back as 2016-17. And that situation was covered in a DLUC uh, webinar yesterday that I attended. We are not in that position. Uh, I have real concerns about this national situation and those councils. Oh, I'm back to normal. That's good to hear. Thank you. Uh, those councils <laughs> where, where lack of audit opinion dates back many years. I am really concerned about how this will play out in the longer term across other councils. I am not talking about Somerset Council or our predecessor councils in Somerset, to be clear. So our financial position, which I realise nobody can talk about predecessor council uh, closing positions and opening position for Somerset Council without looking at the national position uh, on finances. So inflation continues. We've recently seen the LGA publish a compound figure of 14.9% inflation for recent times. Interest rates are continuing to rise. We all know that but after many years of very low rates that causes issues not just for local authorities but for households, particularly with mortgages and rentals and that of course in Somerset is coming at a time where uh, the need for nutrient neutrality is reducing our ability to build houses across Somerset. We also know that the demand on social care continues to grow in complexity and those pre-mentioned inflation and interest rate issues are having the inevitable effect on the providers of social care. So in order to ensure that both executive and the wider members of this council have as much information as possible as we go into the next budget setting ready for February 24, we've planned a session with the chief executive of SIPFA. That date will be the 24th of August. I'm really sorry to plan for August. The other alternative was later in September, and frankly, late September is too late for us. So we're going ahead on the 24th of August, and details will be sent out to all members later today. We're also working in a new way on a risk statement so that that forms part of our budget setting process. And that will also enable us to inform the parish towns and city council more fully of the financial picture for Somerset 
before they start their precepting in November. We'll also continue to work with all partners to ensure that we maximise inward investment in Somerset, creating as much opportunity as possible, particularly for the younger people of Somerset. It is our responsibility to make the most of opportunity while we take care of those most in need. We understand that responsibility. We know we will have to take difficult decisions as we go through the next months and to next February. And we know that we will continue to be challenged through the first years of Somerset Council. That's the task ahead of us. While we undertake that task, I thank, as always, the officers working on the transition, transformation and change work and the, all those officers who are ensuring that business as usual continues. So while I thank them, I hand over to Jason Vaughan for more information on the table I've mentioned and the rest of the paper. Thank you, Chair. Good, good morning. I'm just going to add, add a few things and just clarify a few things in the report. Um, so the report to you today on page 43 has the recommendation to note the current position. So I'll just run through where we are. Um, in paragraph six of the report, we talk about financial and risk implications. Having outstanding audits is clearly quite a significant risk for us. Um, the period at which your accounts are open means that any new accounting rules that come in apply to that period. So you then have to go back and adjust those accounts. Um, and also for me, in terms of uh, taking over five predecessor councils, I actually look to our external auditors to provide me with assurance that actually what's in those accounts is correct. So I'm really keen that we get the accounts signed off by the auditors so that we can have that assurance across the piece that the starting figures for Somerset Council are correct. If I then move on to the table in uh, 17, sorry, I'll just pick up paragraph 15 actually. Uh, just in terms of background, I thought it might be helpful just to tell you in terms of the national picture. So the deadline for the publication of accounts this year was brought forward um, from July to the end of May, despite a consultation that the majority of people said that doesn't seem a sensible thing to do given the current backlogs. Um, in terms of the publication date, the end of May, 70% of councils did not hit that deadline date. So only 30% of councils across the country achieved the deadline. As at the end of July, the figure has increased now 60% of councils across the country. So 188 at 314 councils have now published the accounts. So still 40% of councils still have not published the accounts. That kind of tells you the problems we have in the sector of even just producing the accounts, let alone getting them audited. If I move on to the table at the bottom of page 46 and top of page 47, I'll just run through each of the councils and where we are. So Mendip uh, accounts for 2021. Yes, they've been signed off. Uh, auditors are still working on the 21-22 accounts and we accounts for 22 three on the 12th of June. The Somerset Pension Fund, there are no outstanding uh, audits from prior years. The accounts are published on the 1st of July. Auditors in at the moment going through those accounts and have raised no issues so far. So that is progressing well. The County Council, again, no outstanding audits from prior years. And the accounts were published on the 10th of July. The auditors will be starting their work in September. South Somerset, we have outstanding accounts for 21-22. The auditors are currently in going through those at the moment. We aim to publish the accounts last week. We will be looking to publish them by next Friday, so a revised date, the 11th of August. In terms of Sedgemoor, I'm hoping the 2021, in fact, I've just sent an email to the auditors now confirming no post-balance sheet events, that that will be finalised today. So I'm hoping that 2021 for Sedgemoor will now be signed off. That still leaves 21-22 outstanding. And just to clarify in terms of the publication of the accounts, 
we actually achieved a day early there. So that was the 27th of July rather than the 28th of July in which we published. Somerset and Western Taunton, there are no prior year outstanding accounts and we published on the 3rd of July and the auditors are currently in looking through those accounts as well. So that's, that's a quick overview in terms of those sort of updates to those areas. If I just go down to uh, the way forward in paragraph 20, bottom of page 47. So when we get the final statement of accounts, the thing that allows me to do is clarify the outturn position for uh, the five authorities. Uh, I haven't got that position at the moment, but it is in the region of a 20 million pounds overspend. Taking that into account, we think the position on the reserves overall is that we have a hundred million pounds worth of both general and earmarked reserves. Um, as soon as the accounts are finalised, we'll be able to update those positions with exact figures. And as set out in this report here, that will be reported to the executive in September. So that will be the final outturn position that will give us the reserves position. It will also give us things like the capital receipts position and also the capital program, because uh, there's quite a lot of slippage on the capital program, as you could imagine. So all that will be coming to the September committee. I think it would be amiss of me not to mention the current year's budget monitoring, because this all fits into the overall financial framework. Um, the report for month three, so quarter one of the current financial year, is being considered by corporate and resources scrutiny next Tuesday, the 8th of August. And if you've seen the report, you'll see we are forecasting a 28.6 million pounds overspend. And within that report, we're asking scrutiny to comment on a number of actions to put increased financial controls and parameters around that. Uh, the feedback from scrutiny will be reported to this committee at its next meeting in September, along with the month four budget monitoring position as well. One of the other things we're trying to do corporately is get scrutiny and the executive dates aligned. Um, currently, scrutiny happens uh, after the executive, which actually for budget monitoring, we'd like it pre-scrutiny. So we're, we're trying to sort that out as well as part of a revised timetable for this year. I hope that's helpful in terms of updating and clarifying the position, but very happy to take any questions or comments. OK, first of all, looking around for executive or associate league members for questions or comments. Councillor White. Thank you, Jason, for, <clears throat> for that report. Reflecting on both your comments and also the ones in the press about issues around external audit, I just reflect on the fact that the Audit Commission, which used to have quite a strong directional role across local government finance, um, was wound up some years ago now. And I just wondered from your perspective whether that has also contributed to the issues around um, external finance, external auditing. Yes, very happy to answer that. Um, and it'll be interesting to hear what Rob Whiteman from SITFA says on the 24th of August, because I think his views are quite clear on this, that it's been frankly a bit of a disaster. Um, I, I think abolishing the audit commission we threw the baby out with the bathwater and some of those uh, warnings and assurance and all those things that happened across the sector are no longer happening now um, myself i do rely on the external auditors to reassure me the accounts are correct you know my job is to make sure they're correct i i i you know i'm not on a profit share um, i don't gain by fiddling the bottom line as it were i want them to be correct and I rely on the auditors to help me provide that assurance. I have to say in the last couple of years, I less relied on the auditor's opinion than perhaps I was a few years ago under the audit commission regime, where I think they did a more focused job on local authorities. Um, their focus nowadays has shifted more into the private sector role. So a great deal of their time is spent looking at the valuations of property, plant and equipment. So for instance, this building and the size of the floor layer area and things like that, and how they're taking account of devaluations that, of course, are not the market value of what you would sell the asset for. So there's a lot of wasted work, in my opinion, on the current audit regime. Um, and that was highlighted in the national review that was published a year or so ago. 
um, and it's disappointing that not all the points in that national review has been taken up, resulting in sort of changes to the audit process. I think, as Councillor Lyshon said, um, we are expecting some detailed announcements on how the backlog with audits will be dealt with. I think they're you know, wearing a sector hat now. I understand the need for catch up, but um, the sort of rumours of a blanket would just sign everything off and move on. I think is slightly worrying. Um, and I think for Somerset Council, that slightly worries me. Have we got the starting position right? I ideally want assurance that all five councils' figures coming in are the right starting point, because if we get it wrong now, that may show up in a couple of years' time and be a bit of an issue. So I, I think the whole thing has been a bit of a disaster, frankly. So just to confirm, affirm the situation, you anticipate that all our accounts from the incoming authorities will be fully audited but and have figures for use in terms of budget, both monitoring and going forward by September. Are you optimistic? Uh, we will we will certainly publish all of our um, pieces of uh, information by then. I think as if you look at the table there, I think the, there are a couple of audits planned in toward, you know, start in September. I am reliant on Grant Thornton doing those audits on time and completing them. Um, they, they are under resource constraints. We have seen that slip before. So fingers crossed that yes, September happens and we get those assurances to be able to report the accounts through to the audit committee as planned. But there could be quite a lot of things that change. I think particularly with some of the outstanding accounts from prior years could be an issue that slow this down. That just really is not helpful for Somerset Council. Thank you. I think the question was, are you optimistic? And I think the answer was hopeful. Is that is am I am I interpreting that correctly? Hopeful, yes, yes. At the lower end of the spectrum of hopeful. Okay. Are there any other comments, questions, or observations from lead members or associate lead members? And I've got Councillor Wakefield online. Good morning, Sarah. Oh, good morning. Um, very interested to listen to to this, and obviously uh, it's um, unfortunate to say the least that these delays are happening um, uh, in in finalising the accounts. But I just wanted to ask whether um, Jason could reassure people that a lot of work is going on behind the scenes, notwithstanding the fact that the figures are not finalised, so that there is no question of us allowing these things to slide. We are doing a lot of background work as far as I understand it, but I just think people need to know that uh, uh, while we're waiting for these accounts to be finalised, it doesn't mean we can't get on with um, other preparatory work. I can assure you we are absolutely prioritising getting this done. We are shifting resources around in doing that. Um, just, just in terms of context, we often forget this. Um, the four of the former 151 officers of those councils that started the year, of course, no longer work for us. And we have seen other, other staff leave. That does create some knowledge gaps in terms of the history of those organisations. Um, in terms of finalising the final accounts we got to publish South Somerset, we have put extra resources into that team to do that. Um, and supporting the audits going forward, we will be shifting the resources round to respond to the auditors' responses to make sure we deliver all those on time. It is not stopping a lot of other things. So in terms of the reserve figure and things like that, Soon, you know, within the next week, we will have those final figures and be able to finalise the work on there. So there has been some delays, but it shouldn't be anything that uh, causes any real problems going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I can't see scrutiny chair online or in the room, so move on to other members. I've got Mandy online, so Mandy first, please. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. Um, Jason, I'm just wondering, you know, obviously, understandably, you know, we have got a later date than normal because we're bringing all the accounts together. My question is around actually the audit work. So 
when do we start to fit into their work plan? And the reason I ask that is, do they have to wait for everything to be completed to actually get us into the work plan? When I look at previous years because of their delays, uh, the accounts and finalising them was actually sort of pushed into January, February. And my, my question is, you know, is there a likelihood, if we're not careful, that we won't have these finalised before we sort of head into the next year and certainly set a budget in February? It's a really good question, Mandy. I think I think there's that's a real risk that that could happen. Um, I think, as Councillor Lyshon said, you know, there are some councils that got accounts outstanding going back to 2016-17. Um, I, I, I really don't want us to be in that position because it, it it's the unknown. Um, if you had a big adjustment that dated back a number of years, that could change things like your reserves position or capital receipts position quite significantly. It doesn't stop you setting a budget, but it's some of those real practical things. It's more of a risk. Um, I think in the current audit environment, it's a real real it is a real risk at the moment. The auditor of resources are very scarce. Um, we do wait for some clarification around what's going to happen centrally by government to try and unblock this um, and quite the finer detail of what that means. Uh, it's certainly on the Secretary of State's mind to try and help help deal with the situation. Um, but as I said earlier, I slightly worry if we don't get the council signed off, the assurance that gives me the starting point for the new council isn't right. So. Ideally, I wouldn't want to be here, to be honest. This this is not a pleasant experience of not having your accounts sorted out, but it's where we are and we've just got to work through it. But we, we will we are we will be very quickly moving into the phase of dependent on the auditors and their availability to do stuff. Thank you. So just to confirm, that doesn't go into that phase until we've got everything signed. I we're not in a queue waiting at the moment. We've got to have everything ready before we go into the queue. That was the sort of question. Yeah, yeah. So in, in terms of the auditors doing the work, uh, as set out in the paper, the dates of when they're in doing it, that has been agreed. So okay. they, if we didn't publish something, they can start work. There is enough ah. evidence for them to do those things. So at the moment, they are in South Somerset doing some work, even though we haven't published the 22, 23 accounts. Thank you. And I do absolutely concur with where they put their focus at the moment. I think there are some areas with the challenges all councils face that they could perhaps better focus on. But I'll leave that with you nationally to push that, uh, Jason. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Rick. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm speaking uh, to try and preempt things, really. Um, I'm conscious that, that last year, uh, when the projected overspend was identified, one of the things that this body, the executive, did was ask scrutiny committees to take a look at the overspends in their particular areas with a view to trying to feed back. I'm conscious that we're some way through at the start of this year and I'm trying to preempt things. You're, we're aware, uh, 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 areas are aware of where there are potential overspends and things that are, uh, it would this body be considering at some point asking the appropriate scrutiny bodies to go back over the figures with a review to, to seeing how they can do it. And if that's the case, how soon might that be happening? Because playing catch up is a bit hard at the moment. Uh, thanks, Lee. Um, I think we will we will take the question. Um, it isn't on the outturn of the legacy outturn reports. However, it has been referenced in the comments made. I don't want to go too far down rabbit holes on budget monitoring, if that's OK. By error, but thank you. For yeah, that. No, I'll, I'll, I think we will take it. But just to just to, just to alert members that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to focus on the agenda item and not the, the wider picture. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you, Lee. And thank you, Chair. Um, yes, uh, executive will request that each of the scrutiny committees urgently reviews the budget monitoring position for their areas of responsibility uh, and also the relevant executive members set out the reasons behind the current forecasts and the actions that are being taken to address the positions. So I realise there are more scrutiny committees now and, and they do align with the executive directors 
which I'm very pleased it was put in place in that way. Otherwise, I think monitoring budgets, if they didn't align with executive directors, would have been even more difficult. So, yes, it's definitely a recommendation that this executive will have. Um, those dates for scrutiny meetings, I know that there are some concerns about how often scrutiny committees meet. We need to take that into account from now right through to budget setting and ensure that both scrutiny and audit have their meetings in the right order at the right time. So very much on top of all of that. Thank you. Thank you for that response Anne, and forgive me for preempting uh, another item, but thank you for the response. Uh, thank you, uh, Lee. Uh, any other comments, questions or observations on this report? Not seeing anybody online or in the room, so we'll move to the recommendation. Um, we'll, I do note that we were, I, I listened in on the DLUC um, um, briefing yesterday and was astounded at some of the backlogs nationally on audit. Um, I think there is a is a curious or it, it was it was news to me how, how bad the national picture was on this that so many and i was i was i was worried about safety mall's accounts not being signed off from a couple of years ago and then found out that other places were, were much worse and nobody likes the section 151 officer referring to something as a bit of a disaster um even if it's not our disaster um particularly anyway our recommendation is to note the current position in reporting the outturn report for the previous somerset authorities for the 22-23 financial year and the timetable for completion in paragraph 20. Do we need to add 21, 22 in there for the Sedgemore one that was a year, or is that not necessary? I think you're already, I think you're already noting it, aren't you? Okay. So, in which, in which case, that's that's fine. Um, can I see a proposal for that, Councillor Lyshon, and a second, a Councillor White? All those leave members in favour, please. Those against, that's clearly carried. Thank you very much. And so I'm pleased to move on to item seven, which is the Staple Grove Housing Infrastructure Fund. And I'd like to invite Councillor White to introduce the item. Rose. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, we have a paper in front of us. Um, it refers to Staple Grove, and for those who don't know, it's northwest of Taunton, and it's the development of 1,500 houses. In 2019, we were fortunate enough to receive 14.2 million from the National Housing Infrastructure Fund to help deliver this um, development, primary for a spine road, um, primary school and an associated infrastructure and this this grant um, will be recoverable in due course by the council once they've loaned it out to the developers to fund this activity. Um, the, the grant was for funds until the 31st of March um, 2023. However, between phosphates and COVID, the development of this site has been severely um, constrained and delayed. And so um, the council has um, discussed and has achieved a extension of these funding to March 2024. And it's really important that we do this because otherwise we would lose the 14.2 million. There were part of the negotiation has been a um, slightly refined infrastructure package and that generally, uh, however, the overall infrastructure will go ahead and be delivered as um, originally envisaged in terms of there will be um, a spine road, primary school, highways works, and these will be delivered by the developer in due course using the fund. Um, the council here today, and you'll see in the recommendations, is uh, wishes to enter into a deed of variation on their HIF um, funding agreement with government and these need to be um, carefully um, both considered and have been done so but also to actually get it in place so we can um, retain this funding and ensure the development goes ahead. Um, we need to do this fairly promptly and you will see within the body of the report um, quite a bit of information about how this is going to happen. 
However, um, in terms of the recommendation in front of you, you'll see um, we're wishing to enter into a deed of variation for the grant funding agreement. We want to get in, um, funding agreements with interested parties over how they're going to use the HIF funding and how it's recovered. We need to use the HIF funding to ensure that we acquire interest in land to safeguard the future delivery of a central infrastructure um, on the site and associated activities around it, including a primary school school site. And um, the final recommendation you have in front of you, um, because we're going to have to do this at pace, is to grant delegated authority to the 151 officer and the service directors and my colleagues here on the executive from Children's and Families and Education and Transport and Digital. I have with me three people from the department who've been involved heavily in the negotiations or happy to add anything or answer any questions. Thank you very much, Rose, and welcome, Jenny, Alison and Charlie. And do you want to add anything to what Rose has said? Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. Jenny Clifford, Taunton Garden Town Implementation Manager. Just two points, if I may, members. So firstly, in terms of that refined infrastructure package, the focus is understandably on what can be delivered before the end of the funding availability date, which is the end of March 2024. So we're talking undergrounding and overhead cables and the construction of the um, A358 Spine Road Junction on the western part of the site. And then on the eastern side, um, it's to do with us um, um, proposing to acquire rights um, land rights um, to safeguard that future infrastructure. Second point that I think is significant to us is, as Councillor Wyke has, um, has mentioned, um, this has been structured by way of a loan. So we loan it to the developer. It is recovered by us with interest. And importantly, we have the ability to then recycle those recovered funds locally into more infrastructure to unlock the delivery of further housing. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Anything further? No, thank you. And any lead members or associate lead members uh, wish to comment? Uh, Councillor White, would you not just pop your microphone off and then Councillor Dodge? Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to comment on this because it's Staple Grove is in my board of Staple Grove and Rope Barton. I'd like to thank the officers for the work uh, they've done on this. It would be a tragedy if we were to lose out on that opportunity of um, those funds. And um, it's regrettable that there has been such a delay. My sense is um, the timing is still quite tight, actually, because March 24 is, uh, is not very far away. But um, I'm, I'm kind of very happy with the, the renegotiated uh, terms, particularly um, interest in land on Staple Grove East for the primary school to make sure we safeguard that um, infrastructure. And um, I hope that under D, the local ward uh, members will be updated when any decisions are made. And I know we have been kept in the picture very well to date. Thank you. Uh, that's pleasing to hear. I don't think there was any response needed to that. Thank you, uh, Dixie. Um, any other comments from League members or associate League members? Um, just looking around the room. Not seeing anything in the room, not seeing anything online. So we will move to the recommendation. Do I have a proposal, please? Councillor Wyke. Secondly, Councillor Ruddle to approve the full recommendations as set out in the paper. Can I see those lead members in favour, please? And those against, that's clearly carried. OK. Um, item eight, um, we have the executive forward plan. Are there any comments or questions on that? In which case I can declare the meeting closed. Can I thank all members and officers for their contribution this morning? Really very much appreciated. Thank you very much.